Welcome to the podcast of the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. I'm Matthew Hofarth. Today is February 4th, 2022, and I'm speaking with Richard Wetzel, who is a research fellow at the German Historical Institute in Washington, D.C. Richard has written and edited numerous books and articles, including Beyond the Racial State, Rethinking the Third Reich, Crime and Criminal Justice in Modern Germany, and Inventing the Criminal, A History of German Criminology, 1880 to 1945. Thank you for joining us, Richard. Thank you for having me. Today, we will be discussing the history of German racial science and racial theories during the Nazi period from 1933 to 1945. This follows from the first episode in this series, which discussed German racial science before 1933. In subsequent episodes, we will be discussing German racial science after the end of World War II. But before we get started, Richard, could you tell us a bit about your work and your background? Yes, uh, thank you, Matt. So I was raised in Germany, but I came here for college. I'm half German, half American, and got all my academic training in this country. I wrote a dissertation at, at Stanford University on uh, the criminal justice system, penal reform in Imperial Germany. After that, I got interested in the history of criminology and wrote a book on the history of German criminology, which you mentioned a moment ago which of course is all about uh, explaining crime. And it turns out in the German case, there was a lot of research on the supposed biological causes of crime. So that made me essentially become a historian of science, even though my training really is that of a general uh, historian of modern Germany. And since then, I've basically pursued those two tracks. I've continued to work on the history of a criminal justice in modern Germany, also in the 20th century, in the Weimar period, in the Nazi period. And I've also continued my interest in the history of the biosciences or human sciences in Germany with a research project on racial science in Nazi Germany, which I guess is what we're going to talk about today. Wonderful. Thank you, Richard. Could you talk to us about the relationship of German science and medicine to the Nazi regime? Yes, I thought I would start with uh, some remarks on what the situation was initially after 1945. And the situation was that after the Second World War, most German medical doctors, uh, anthropologists, human geneticists denied responsibility for Nazi crimes. And the physical anthropologists did this basically by claiming that their discipline had been abused by the Nazis, so they portrayed themselves as victims of the Nazis, and arguing that you know only a very small minority of outsiders and marginal figures in the discipline had collaborated with the Nazi regime, but the mainstream of the discipline had not. And in a similar fashion, medical doctors in Germany also exculpated themselves by arguing that eugenics had nothing to do with Nazi racial policy. And the argument was, and this will not be surprising to many listeners, that eugenics, of course, had been an international movement that had support in many countries and was not specific to the Nazi regime. And therefore, the argument of German medical doctors was that their participation in compulsory sterilization during the Nazi era had nothing to do with Nazi racial policy and nothing to do with Nazi crimes. So this sort of apologetic discourse really dominated starting at the end of World War II and really well into the 1970s. And it was not until the 1980s that a major challenge was mounted to these apologetic accounts. And that challenge came from a new generation of researchers. Not all of them were historians. Some of them were psychiatrists, reform-minded psychiatrists uh, in the 1980s. So historians, as well as psychiatrists, began to conduct research on what then became known as the forgotten victim groups. And by this, I mean they did research on the forced sterilization program in Nazi Germany, which uh, sterilized close to half a million uh, Germans. They did research on the euthanasia murders of people with mental and physical disabilities that had occurred between 1939 and 1945. They did research on the persecution of the so-called Zigeuner gypsies, the member of the Sinti and Roma, on the persecution of homosexuals, on the persecution of asocials, people labeled as asocials, I should say, that is, uh, people who were 
targeted for their supposedly deviant behavior, homeless people, people without regular work, and so on, who were classified as asocial and interned in concentration camps. So there was this great flowering of all this work in the 1980s, and that accomplished two things. The first was that it broadened the historical understanding of Nazi racial policy, what was often called in the German context Rassenpolitik, or what we might also call biopolitics. It broadened the understanding of Nazi Rassenpolitik beyond anti-Semitism to include the persecution of a whole spectrum of target groups, all of whom were persecuted on the basis of their supposed biological inferiority. So it widens the understanding of what Nazi racism is. And the second thing the research on the forgotten victim groups accomplished was that it demonstrated the complicity of medical doctors, human geneticists, physical anthropologists in Nazi biopolitics, beyond a doubt. This is fascinating, Richard. If I could ask you to go into uh, something you've already mentioned, which is at the beginning of the Nazi regime, how did racial scientists, medical doctors, anthropologists, human geneticists, etc., how did they become involved in the racial policies and crimes of the Third Reich? Let me answer that, Matt, by giving two contrasting examples of two prominent scientists and their involvement. And the first case I'd like to talk about is that of a psychiatrist by the name of Ernst Rudin. Rudin was the director of the Deutsche Forschungsanstalt für Psychiatrie in Munich, which was Germany's leading institute of psychiatric research. He was prominent internationally. In 1932, he had become president of the International Federation of Eugenics Organizations. Rudin was convinced that a great many psychiatric conditions were genetic, and he became a leader in the German eugenics movement on its right wing. And I just want to mention here that it's important to remember that, you know, eugenics was an international movement and that in Germany, as in some other places, eugenics had support from across the political spectrum, all the way on the left over to the socialists. So it's important to remember for the general context that you could be a eugenicist without being an anti-Semite and without believing in the superiority of the Nordic race. However, of course, there was also a right wing to the German eugenics movement, and that's what Rudin was a part of. So Rudin was very much sympathetic to, to Völkisch racial theories, that is, theories that treated the German people and the Nordic race as, as superior. And this right wing of the German eugenics movement preferred the term racial hygiene to the term eugenics. The German word is Rassenhygiene. It referred exactly to the same thing. It referred to eugenics. But of course, the term racial hygiene played on the ambiguity of the word race, right? It's ambiguity between is it just referring to the population as a whole or is it referring to an anthropological race? So Rudin, on the right wing of the German eugenics movement, welcomed the Nazi regime because he saw an opportunity to realize his uh, eugenic agenda. And the Nazi official who was brought in to take charge of the public health department at the interior ministry and to start the planning for sterilization legislation, a man named Arthur Gutt. Almost immediately, as soon as he arrived in, in May 1933, so we're talking just a few months into the regime, recruited Rudin as the scientific expert for drafting the sterilization law that was then passed in July 1933, and it took effect in January 1934. And Rudin was very much directly involved in the formulation of the law. So let me say a few things about the law. Um, and we have to remember that until this Nazi legislation, the German eugenics movement had failed to pass any kind of sterilization law. So in Weimar, Germany, sterilization, even voluntary sterilization, remained illegal. So the situation in Germany was different, for instance, from the situation in the United States, where people had been sterilized already since, you know, before the First World War. 
there was a draft that had been produced in 1932 that provided for voluntary sterilization, but that never became law. So the Nazi law that Rudin had a major hand in was more radical than the Weimar draft because it provided for compulsory sterilization. On the other hand, it was slightly more circumscribed because it limited sterilization to specific diagnoses that were enumerated in the law, including what they called congenital feeble-mindedness. The German word was angeborener Schwachsinn, uh, schizophrenia, manic depressive disorders, and some other conditions. The Nazis also set up so-called hereditary health courts that were staffed by two doctors and a judge that made these decisions. Now, Rudin didn't just use his position of influence to really shape the legislation and try to make it as radical as he could. He also used his position as an, a co-author of the official commentary in the law to push for the widest possible uh, implementation. And one issue here was uh, feeble-mindedness was defined as an intellectual disability in Germany at this time. And Rudin pushed very hard in this commentary to expand its definition to what he called disturbances in emotions, will, ethical sentiments. So what this was meant to do was open the door to sterilizing homeless people, people without regular work, people convicted of a crime, and so on. In other words, to target all sorts of social deviance. So Rudin who was a Swiss citizen, but nevertheless joined the Nazi party in 1937, is the perfect example of a racial scientist who saw the regime as the perfect opportunity to realize his own agenda. And in his case, his scientific convictions were perfectly compatible with his participation in Nazi racial policy. Now, the second case, the second example I'd like to talk about is that of Eugen Fischer. And his story is interesting because he's someone who clashed with the regime early on. So he had initially a very different experience from Rudin. So Fischer was a professor of anthropology at the University of Berlin. And he was the director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Anthropology, Human Genetics and Eugenics in Berlin which uh, was a famous institute, Germany's largest and most prestigious institution uh, in the field of physical anthropology and human genetics. So Fischer delivered a public lecture on February 1st, 1933, just two days after the Nazis uh, took power, on the topic of racial mixing and mental aptitude. And this, of course, had been scheduled before, you know, he could have known that the Nazis were going to seize power. But of course, when he delivers the lecture, he's perfectly aware that the Nazis have seized power. And what he argues in this lecture is that the mixing of races generally had a beneficial effect on offspring, that high cultures were usually the product of a mixing of races, not of their purity. And he uses the Europe, Central Europe, as a case in point and says the great flowering of culture in Central German-speaking Europe is due to the fact that it took place in a racial mixing zone. And toward the end of his lecture, he explicitly comments on the question of race mixing between the Nordic races and the Jews and argues that while racial mixing with recently arrived Jews from Eastern Europe, the so-called Ostjuden, was problematic, racial mixing with German Jewish families who had long resided in Germany was, was fine. So you will not be totally surprised uh, if I tell you that this lecture immediately landed Fischer in hot water because it was a key tenet of Nazi ideology that German Jews were racially inferior and posed a threat to the German folk. So Fischer's case that racial mixing with Jews that had lived in Germany for a long time was fine, was uh, anathema to the Nazis. Now, Fischer clearly had thought about this 
when he gave his lecture, he knew the political situation, but it's clear that he thought that his position as Germany's probably most prominent anthropologist, you know, would allow him to influence Nazi racial policy at this early stage in the regime. But he'd misjudged the situation. And uh, Richard Walter Dare, who was the head of the SS Office on Race, immediately called for Fischer's dismissal. And Fischer was really only saved because another influential person, Artur Goethe, I just mentioned a moment ago, who was the Nazi official at the Interior Ministry in charge of public health, came to his defense. And Goethe, and I've looked at the correspondence, I mean, Goethe makes the case to Dare and others who have it in for Fischer and says, listen, this is Germany's most famous anthropologist. He will provide scientific legitimacy to our racial policy in the future, especially on the international stage. So it's in our interest to keep him in place. And at the same time, he leaned on Fischer to revise his position on racial mixing. And Fischer hums and haws, but in the end, he does revise his position. He's not willing to say that Jews are racially inferior, but Jews are racially different. The German word is rassisch andersartig, different in kind, and that that's why it's inadvisable to have racial mixing. So he does back down. So what we can see here is Fischer's case is really quite different from Rudin's. Whereas Rudin's scientific convictions are perfectly consistent with his participation in Nazi racial policy, Fischer's were not. Now, to be sure, Fischer did subscribe to Nordic racial theory. He talks about the Nordic race in this lecture. We have considerable evidence that Fischer was anti-Semitic. And he was most likely actually quite sympathetic to much of the Nazi political agenda. And he joined the Nazi party in 1940. But on this very important issue of racial mixing, he clearly took a position that was different from, from Nazi ideology. And even more importantly, Fischer's whole scientific conception of race was not really compatible with the crude anti-Semitism of the Nazi regime. Richard, you've mentioned Nordic racial theory and different theories about racial mixing. I wonder if you could elaborate on the various racial theories that competed with each other during the Nazi era, who supported them and why? So for the first two years of the regime, from early 33 to 35, the most important conflict in the field of racial science was that between Nordic racial theory on the one hand, and on the other hand, the concept of a German race. And let me briefly talk about uh, each of these. So the major proponent of Nordic racial theory was Hans Günther, who was trained really as a philologist and was essentially a self-taught anthropologist. The publication that made him famous, which came out in 1922, was called Rassenkunde des Deutschen Volkes, which is not that easy to translate, but I would say maybe racial guide to the, to the German people. So in this work, uh, Günther argued that the German people was racially mixed. It was composed of six different races, the Nordic, Eastern, Western, Daneric, Phallic, East Baltic races. And among these, the Nordic race, you will not be surprised to hear, was superior. Now, Günther's major concern in his writings was that the Nordic race was becoming increasingly diluted by these other races. And he therefore called for a policy of Aufnordung, Nordification, although it sort of remained vague how exactly that would be implemented. But it just bears noting, you know, that in his pre-Nazi writings, the main threat to the Nordic race comes from the dilution with other races present in the German people and not from the Jews. Right? And the Jews, by the way, Gunther regarded just like the German people as a racially mixed people. So Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, was enamored of Nordic racial theory and introduced Nordic racial criteria 
for the recruits to the SS in 1931, you know, skull measurements, anthropometric measurements. So for the SS, they took this, you know, they were trying to implement this and use Nordic racial criteria for their recruitment. So with this background, it's easy to see that when the Nazis took power in 1933, some people worried, and this included people in the Nazi party, that you know, if Nordic racial theory were to become the official basis for, for Nazi racial policy, there would be a danger that the whole German population might be subject to a process of Nordicist uh, racial selection. And that's one reason why some Nazi leaders supported the rival concept, which I now want to turn to, which was the concept that there was a German race. And this was propounded by uh, two people, uh, the anthropologist Karl Zala and the botanical geneticist Friedrich Merkenschlager. And uh, those two were fiercely critical of Gunther's uh, Nordic racial theory. And they propounded a dynamic rather than static conception of race and basically made the case you know, that the German race was constantly evolving from the mixture of different racial elements. So Zala and Marken, Merkenschlager were saying races can't be defined by stable, static, physiological or psychological or genetic characteristics, but all races are malleable. They use this phrase, all races are, quote, states of equilibrium that reflect the influences of heredity and environment. Now, compared to Gunther's Nordicism, you can see that this concept of a German race offers the advantage of erasing any racial distinctions among Germans. So thereby making you know, the German folk, the German people and the German race fully congruent. That, that was seen as an advantage by those who were worried that Nordic racial theories would create invidious racial distinctions among the German people. So those were the two theories and for the first two years, 1933, 1934, until early 35, they were both able to be out there. Their proponents were able to publish, and they sort of duked it out. And for these two years, key political actors that were trying to shape racial policy were essentially engaged in a conflict over which of these theories would prevail. And so, the camps were basically these two camps. The most prominent advocates of the concept of a Deutsche Rasse, of a German race, were Gerhard Wagner, who was the head of the Nazi Physicians Association and chief of the health section of the party's central office, and Achim Gerke, who was at the Interior Ministry and expert for racial research. Now, both of these people, long-standing party members, died in the wool Nazis, notorious anti-Semites. But they support the concept of the German race because they are concerned that Nordic racial theories might lead sooner or later to invidious racial distinctions being made among the German people. On the other side, the key figure opposing the notion of a German race was Walter Gross, who headed the party's Office of Racial Policy, the so-called Rassenpolitisches Amt. And his concern was different. Unlike Wagner and Gerke, Gross was afraid that the concept of the German race might open the door to including Jews among the German race. And therefore, he wanted to ban the concept. Now, this is clearly something that never occurred to Wagner and Gerke on the other side, who were absolutely anti-Semitic. But Gross was worried about this. So he forged a strategic alliance with the SS, which was fully invested in Nordic racial theory. And he struck the decisive blow in January 35, when it looked like the other side, Wagner and Gerke, were ready to take this matter all the way to Hitler 
he issued an official ban on the concept of a German race, um, convinced the Minister of Education to revoke Zala's teaching credentials and ended his academic career. And this success, Gross's success in getting the concept of a German race banned also demonstrates that he had at that point succeeded in establishing his office, the party's office of racial policy as the ultimate arbiter of what was permissible in racial science research and in racial policy. What are the major conclusions coming out of your study of the relationship between racial science and Nazi racial policy? So let me just make three points. And the first one is, it's often said that everything in the Third Reich, everything in Nazi Germany was about race, right? And there is considerable truth to that. But I would argue that race can't really serve as a category of analysis for historians seeking to understand Nazi Germany because it was such a diffuse and contested concept. And I would say for that reason, if we want to understand how race functioned in the Third Reich, we need to first analyze the concept of race, the competing racial theories, and the ways in which these different concepts were deployed, both by the scientists on the one hand and by Nazi policymakers on the other hand for their own strategic purposes. Another way of saying this is this, that the meaning of race was anything but obvious in Nazi Germany, and therefore it has to be carefully analyzed. The second thing I'd like to say is that racial policy in Nazi Germany, you know, is still often understood as a conflict between the master race, which is often referred to as the Aryan race, and the Jews. But in Nazi ideology, the master race did not yet exist. It had to be created. It had to be created in two ways. First, by processes of racial selection, according to the criteria of Nordic racial theory. Now, as we saw, those were already being applied to applicants to the SS, which saw itself as a racial elite. It was not applied to the German population at large, although there was always the possibility of doing that in the future. And once Nazi Germany went to war and occupied Eastern Europe, the SS very much sought to apply racial criteria to screen the population uh, in occupied Poland to see who could join the German folk and who could not. So on the one hand, there are these processes of racial selection that are meant to create the master race. And then, of course, there are also the processes of eugenic selection, that is the weeding out of uh, inferior genetic traits through mass sterilization. And the sterilization law called these inferior genetic traits Erbkrankheit, hereditary diseases. That is, they used purposely a very medical terminology. But I think I already mentioned this, the diagnosis of feeble-mindedness was actually used to sterilize people who exhibited all sorts of behavior that the regime found undesirable. You know, vagrancy, sexual minorities, promiscuity, crime, wayward youth. All this kind of deviant behavior was interpreted as evidence of genetic defects. And that effectively meant that people who exhibited behavior that was considered deviant were at an increasing risk of being excluded from the master race through sterilization or segregation in a concentration camp or eventually also getting killed, whether in a camp or in the euthanasia program. And since anyone is at some risk of coming into conflict with social norms at some point, potentially, I would argue, anyone was at risk of being excluded from the master race, from the Volksgemeinschaft, on the grounds of being genetically inferior. So I think it's important to understand that it's not here's the master race and here are clearly defined groups that we're excluding, but it is very much a more dynamic process, one that led to an increasing radicalization. Now, of course, we know this because this radicalization led to the murder 
of the European Jews led to the Holocaust. That is, the means by which Jews were excluded moved from discrimination to segregation to murder. But what I would argue is the process of radicalization can also be observed in a kind of broadening of the scope of who was targeted by Nazi racial policy, by Nazi biopolitics. And I would argue that was potentially anybody who violated social norms. And you know, it's interesting that this fear that eventually the target groups of Nazi eugenics and racial policy would expand beyond all reason was actually articulated of all people by Gerhard Wagner, who I mentioned earlier, who was the head of the Nazi Physicians Association and the head of the public health office at the party, an absolutely died in the wool Nazi, anti-Semite, and so on, who in the second half of the 1930s began to publicly criticize the sterilization campaign as having gone too far, targeting too many people, especially under the rubric of feeble-mindedness, and being absolutely out of control. And there was a very public feud between Wagner on the one hand and uh, Rudin, who I mentioned, and Goethe on the other hand. So it's interesting that even at the time, a died on the wool Nazi began to worry that the eugenic policy, the racial policy, the biopolitics of this was becoming too radical. And then the last thing I'd like to say is, what have we learned? What are the conclusions? And this is something I've mentioned before, is that I think as one studies this more carefully, it becomes clear that racial science had very different impacts on different parts of Nazi racial policy. And we saw this very nicely with the two examples that I mentioned, right? So the example of Rudin shows there was a very strong influence of racial scientists on sterilization policy and uh, on its implementation. When we talk about the euthanasia killings, the role of psychiatrists in the implementation is crucial. One does have to say there is a big difference where sterilizations were a public policy, you know, that was initiated with public support and public input. The murder of the uh, mentally ill was a secret policy, so the, the origins are a very different kind of story. Um, but in the implementation, of course, psychiatrists were, were crucial. When we talk about the persecution of the Sinti and Roma, the so-called gypsies, the influence of racial scientists in that case was very, very direct and important. And this has to do with a particular person, Robert Ritter, who fancied himself, styled himself as an expert on Sigoyna and directly cooperated with the police and with the SS, and his racial categorizations had a direct effect on people's fate, who would be shipped off to a camp and who would eventually be killed. So there's a very direct link there. And then I think, you know, once Nazi Germany went to war, conquered Poland, took over that territory, a process of racial screening began of the population to see who would join the German folk and who wouldn't. Racial scientists were very important in that. The case where racial scientists probably had the least influence is actually the case of anti-Semitic policy. And what I'm talking about here is the formulation and the escalation of the policy. And there I think it's fair to say political actors are the key actors in making the policy decisions. And the role of the racial scientists clearly is to give it scientific cover to give it scientific legitimacy, and I've talked about that. Fisher is certainly able to do that. But racial scientists are not in the driver's seat for driving the decision-making on anti-Semitic policy in contrast to uh, eugenics, sterilization policy, and in contrast also to some extent to the persecution of so-called gypsies, the Sinti and Roma. Clearly, the issue of race and its connection to science and medicine is a hot-button topic today. Are there things we can learn from the uses and abuses of race during the Nazi era that can inform a way of talking about race in science today? Yes, I mean, that's a good question. Of course, it's a difficult one to answer. We all know as historians, it's actually very difficult to formulate clear lessons 
from history. And yet, of course, we hope that studying history and making it available for people to, uh, to, to, to read about the history will, will have some benefit. I'm going to make two points, I think. One is, I think, all too often racial science of the Nazi era is referred to as a pseudoscience. And this terminology creates a comforting distance between Nazi-era science and science today, right? And the implication, of course, is pseudoscientists who believe in crackpot racist theories, yeah, they might have become complicit with a murderous regime, but real scientists, scientists today, would not. But dismissing Nazi-era racial science as pseudoscience really is misleading, and I hope that's already become clear in my presentation, because, you know, many of Germany's leading racial scientists, including Rudin and Fischer, who we talked about, were internationally respected scientists. Uh, and the research program, for instance, at Fischer's Berlin Institute very much kept up with international developments in physical anthropology and human genetics. They knew about population genetics uh, and so on. So historians of science in Nazi Germany have therefore dropped the term pseudoscience already for quite some time. And the logic is simply if research at the time was published in scientific journals and discussed at scientific meetings, then we historians should treat it as science and not pseudoscience. So among historians, I'm not saying anything new. The matter is already settled. But I do think that in the larger scientific community, in the natural sciences, in the biosciences, there is still a sense, uh, and I've seen this myself when I've talked to people who do research today, that Nazi science can be dismissed as pseudoscience. And I do think that that creates a false sense of distance between Nazi science and today's science. And I've sometimes purposely been provocative and said, you know, science in Nazi Germany is just as much normal science as science today, which often you get a lot of pushback to. And then people ask, are you saying it was good science? And of course, the answer to that has to be, as a historian of science, that is not my job to decide what's good science and bad science. I study what was considered science at the time. And my point here is really that if we can get also the community of scientists today not to dismiss Nazi science as pseudoscience, then I think they will realize that perhaps studying what happened there is also relevant for scientists today. Nazi Germany essentially presents an extreme case of the interaction of science and politics, but science always interacts with politics. And it's good to remember that, you know, some of the worst ethical breaches in medicine and in the biosciences in Nazi Germany occurred in the service of research that was very much in the international mainstream. So you don't have to be a crackpot, you don't have to be a pseudoscientist in order to commit ethical breaches. And the second point I'd like to make is that, as we saw, there are different motivations for scientists to collaborate with the Nazi regime. We saw that some scientists, like Rudin, collaborated from genuine scientific conviction, right? They saw the regime as an opportunity to implement part of their scientific agenda. For Rudin, that was an aggressive sterilization program. But we also saw that other scientists, like Fischer, were actually very conscious that Nazi anti-Semitic policy in particular had no scientific basis. The case of eugenics is different. Most of them did think that had a scientific basis, but anti-Semitic policy was different. But as we saw, Fischer still cooperated, eagerly so, to preserve his position and the funding for his institute. Now, morally speaking, I think these collaborators from opportunistic motives are no less culpable, some would say more culpable, than those who collaborated from conviction. And I think their behavior, that is those people who collaborated not out of conviction, but from more opportunistic motives, is well worth pondering, I think, for scientists in any time and place. Because of course, 
every scientist wants to get his or her research funded, and a good part of the funding always depends on politics. So learning from looking at Nazi Germany as an extreme case of the relationship of science to politics, I think, is relevant also for scientists and especially bioscientists today. Thank you, Richard, for sharing your work and your perspectives with us. Thank you for having me, Matt. This has been a podcast from the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. For additional resources on this and other topics, please visit our website at chstm.org. This podcast is made possible with the generous support of the Pew Charitable Trusts and the Rita Allen Foundation.